Hello there, welcome. Today we're looking at how Kayo beats his most feared opponent in the current meta. It's Hatchet Dory. And how exactly you use your equipment to make this matchup a bit favored for you. Now, if you're starting out with a cast once on turn zero, you'll always want to cast that. That's just five value you can take with uh, into your next turn or maybe even an agility token and six might. So that's a no-brainer. And also you always want to set up that two for something brute attack into your arsenal because it passed really nicely with your blood rush your other go again attacks and so on dory gets a lot of value out of her dynamos in nearly every matchup and to kind of play around that we're looking to make really big turns and then sort of take a turn off and then again swing really big so she maybe only gets half half of the dynamo blocks she would usually get Getting an agility token from the Clash of Might is always nice. Now we're open to do something like swing command and conquer with all the buffs and then cast the cast bonds after that. Unfortunately, we're getting seen seat here. So if we don't want to use um, value in losing our card, we should probably block this out. Though there's a, a decision to be made here, you could also just let that hit and fire off, as I said, a CNC and cast bonds. But because Dory doesn't have an arsenal anyways, we might as well just give that away and then come in with a really big swing big. And now already we are playing our game plan into our game plan. We are not just swinging for 7, we're swinging for 13. And the Valiant Dynamo blocking one is not that big in comparison. Um, Dory actually forgetting putting that into here, but that sh maybe it just doesn't matter anyways um now the hand again we don't even have go again we just want to use as blocking and um a setup hand dory gets a lot of value also out of her three hatchet swing turns um and to swing a third time with a hatchet she needs to hit with one of those so whenever dory is setting up a bigger hand you want to look to also overblock maybe so they don't get the the attack react to make it hit now this plays into our game plan fairly well we're investing all her cards here and we can just block that out if we let it hit she can pay with her last card in hand to swing that last x and would surely leak some damage so we just put that it's Gapskin Leathers in here, I'd say. I deny here that. And then we can set up that Runner Runner in Arsenal. It's once again a Brood card. It costs two. And this just pairs nicely with all our big, all, all the big turns we want to play. We are not using the Apex Bone Breakers here because the might would just be wasted because once again we don't want to attack on our next turn. Nice. And now we get a huge hand that we, we can throw. A key equipment in this matchup is actually the Scowling Flashback, which says that if you, whenever you block with it, you will intimidate a card out of the enemy's hand and they can't even react to it with an attack reaction, for example. So if you do that at the exactly right moment, when for example they have two cards in hand, nothing floating, and they still need to give their card go again, you either get their resource card intimidated, so they can only give go again but can't pitch for the next X, or they can't even uh, give it go again. And then you have them sitting on two cards that they weren't able to play, and you just end their turn right there. Now the hand we have is um, has quite a few play options. We could play out the Blood Rush Bellow and go for a claw into another attack. Because if we want to play Blood Rush Bellow, we have to pitch with Telim from Limp. Because Blood Rush Bellow needs to discard a 6 power card. And the other play would be to play the Telim from Limp pitching the Blood Rush Bellow. Because also the Telim from Limp needs to discard a 6 attack. And both these cards are random. Uh, because we don't have any other go against than our claw, though, the the blood rush line wouldn't um, would very likely not be as much damage as the Telem from Limp. 
Talent from them says that you just double the next attack, uh, the next brute attack's power. So we can do um, Talent from them, Claw, and then Runner Runner for 15 and 16 with the Might Regenerate, while Blood Rush Bella would just be 5 from the Claw, 9 uh, from the extra Might, and 8 from the Runner Runner. Now to play a powerful card, a uh, hand like this rather, we just see whether Dory might just have it. And if she does, that, that's good for her, but we just try to get the max value out of our hand here. And we can even keep that Agile Windup for our turn to discard it in there, so we get Agile Agility even for the next turn. Oh, that is probably a mistake, or maybe I'm not paying attention to something. Yeah, I probably uh, forgot just there that I could have also just attacked with Tele um get the go again from before the claw from Telem from them. But we're still throwing the huge attack now. So that did not change. And our next turn should once again be just for blocking and setting a card up in our arsenal. Another sweet thing in this matchup you can do with your equipment is getting an MI token whenever you get your sand packings or CNC's. And ideally you already have a, another might from maybe a wind up you discarded the turn before and then you're coming in with this arsenal disruption effect for eight the eight is quite important because seven, uh, seven is easily blockable by the dynamos and two hand cards but if you get two might cards to go with that you can uh, you can make them block with either an extra equipment or an extra card from hand or they just straight up lose, lose their arsenal Now, unfortunately, we are not drawing many block cards here, so blocking this turn out isn't really an option. The only th the real thing we can do here is just throw the bear fangs and arsenal the other bear fangs. And while this does not exactly play into our game plan, plan uh, we're still coming in for 9. And with a way above rate attack, we're basically investing 2 cards from our hand to get a attack for 9. And then we still have that really good arsenal target. Also Dory invested into blocking earlier, so she doesn't have the best of hands. So yeah, out of three cards here, we got 12 value, which is 4 per card, and then off of the M card will be our arsenal target. Dory also played a few power cards already. All red hit and runs are, uh, are out. So that's always nice to see. And it also explains why we're quite even on life totals. Maybe a bit behind.
Now, this hand is potentially a case for scapeskin leathers, though I would say rolling those on a hand like this basically always is a bait because just throwing a two card hand here is not making progress towards a game plan but is still as i said a really good rate um conversion on on our hand cards and still come in with this two for eight um and we dodge the chance of just maybe skipping a turn due to scapeskin leathers and the value we lose by blocking is just basically two if we were to attack with those two cards we get another eight value if we block with them we get six um, so in just favor of consistency, I prefer not rolling scabs in situations like these and just keep them for the, the most dire ones where it's just the only possible um, way to win the game maybe. Also being very disciplined with the armor here while we are whiffing on the bear fangs, which is kind of unlucky since we also have quite a few um, non six is out already. Yes, it's important to be uh, very conservative with the armor against Dorinthia. You really want to sniff out those those big turns, maybe with spill blood, where where just blocking out both X's is is most important, so you deny them another um, X swing for five. And yeah, while we are not really been able to play into our game plan those last two turns. Are we still sitting okay? Though this is potentially a big turn for Dorinthia. Or the opposite. Um, they have this uh, agility set up and were like fine blocking within Spillblood, which either means they have another Spillblood, Spillblood in hand or maybe just a full red hand. By the looks of it, they do have more, more power cuts though. Now this is a hand we can set up with. Ideally, I think you want to just block with both both blues on the right here. And then in your own turn, discard Agile wind up to get the agility and might for the turn after that. But it does seem like I decide against that. And maybe do want to put on the pressure and throw the bear things as well. Um, which, well, uh, has several implications. I also. I blocked with the Apex Bonebreaker there earlier and didn't get the might, so that, that of course is a misplay. I'm just blocking with two blues and sending the windup to set up would have been the way better, better play and the play that is uh, more beneficial to our, our strategy into Dorinthia. Though, and this might be... Um, uh, a corner case here sometimes it is beneficial to before you want to go for a big turn already threaten some damage because this way we just got out uh, a direct now and let's say for example they don't have another direct in their hand right now they will be way less able to block out the big turn we sent towards them now okay and also but right now be a flashback angle no not yet what we're looking to do is just swing that savage feast savage feast has an insane value if you already have a, an agility token the play of going savage feast pitching pack all and throwing claw after that is a two card 10. you get a my token you get to Swing Claw, which is 4, and you throw the Savage Feast, which comes in for 6. And all of that just with a card pitch, the Savage Feast played, and yes, you discard a card, but you draw one up. Unfortunately for us, we do draw into a blue card here, so... <laughs> kind of denying us the value there. 
Uh, what's really unlucky for us is that we have not seen a Blood Rush yet. Because the first Blood Rush will always be kind of like Luster against Balance of Justice. And we're already at 11 HP. So uh, seeing two um, Blood Rushes can get kind of tricky. Um, we could have played that one earlier and lost all two damage um, on the exchange. That was definitely an option. Okay, but to look on the bright side, they've invested quite a bit of armor now. We still have the flashback up. And we do have three more blood rushes in our deck. Once again, I'm looking at a good setup and we might be able to put Wild Ride in the arsenal, discard an Agile Wind up. Um, so we could just block four here. Let's say they do have an attack react that buffs this. Um, then they would, on the other hand, not have an attack react to give to give go again with um, on the second claw. And but I'm actually deciding to just commit the scowling here because indeed we are denying a third X swing in every case now because they only get to keep one. Go again, source. And by the looks of it, we actually they actually only had one, which we denied. So now we even get to play this hand. Which is possible because Wild Ride has an initial go again. And drawing it, the Blood Rush here is quite interesting. Just casting this is uh, yeah, it's not even only risky, it's just not a good play because we would draw up into two cards again. And even if one is a blue, we can only swing either claw or that other attack we may might draw. So just coming in with a claw here afterwards and putting that blood rush in, in arsenal is, is way more efficient. That way we also get them either to 3, uh, to 2 HP I mean, or to a, a hand total of 3. So we either significantly weaken their next turn, uh, which lets us keep a big hand for Blood Rush, or we get them to 2, which means they are in Reckless Swing range. I am actually not playing my Reckless Swing copy into this matchup, but they don't know that. Uh, but they don't respect it either. So good on them. And now, wow, if we get to keep uh, this hand near to completion, that would be insane. Just making them show uh, their face here, basically. If they have an attack react, they should kind of play it now. Or let's say if they have a blade for they should play it now. Right. Um, and now it's either or. Either we get a Gogan attack react from them or the... Um, or the pump. The only if they had both, they actually do have the tunic trigger, but that's like the only um pair of cards that would punish us here. And now we created three might, and oh, let's see, they actually have the perfect pair to punish us here. Um, luckily, I think our life total might just save us here, anyways. And now. 
we can come in with claw and then attack. Let's see what we draw. Nice. So we're getting um, 13 damage in on the three card hand here. Five from claw, eight from the agile wind up. Oh, actually, I forgot the my tokens. It's quite a bit more. So we're definitely demanding there. Demanding quite a few hand cards now. Um, a risk we uh, we might run into now. And a reason for maybe keeping a card there earlier, though it wasn't really possible because of the attack reacts, is that we can draw into a hand that is not outright playable. It's because we don't have an agility, agility token. We are still missing um, one Blood Rush that should be close and a several, I think two Wild Rides. So the chances of us just drawing a natural go again are good. But not super high and if we only, if we're only able to threaten let's say six on that next turn, this game can get really close all of a sudden. We should either get a whole hand or the tunic here. And they are only keeping one card. Uh, one card can present two X-Wings though with the agility token. Um, I think we wouldn't actually mind. Because in that case we get to convert one of our hand cards into block. And they don't get the arsenal set up. I think it's a lot scarier if they chose to arsenal this card and we get stuck on, yes, exactly a hand like this. Now, um, with a hand like this where we're only able to threaten 6 damage, the other option is throw assault and battery and set up a next turn with all the tokens and a savage feast and arsenal. But leaving them on what is going to be a 3 card hand because they're only forced to block with 2 cards. Um... Now I see myself in a losing position here, so I actually choose to roll the scab skin leathers. But this is one of the only um, times I, I would choose to do so. And of course we get paid off because of our discipline. And now this game is completely, completely done for them, fortunately. We at least come in with Claw and another Savage Feast here. No, wait. Um, claw and white. Let's see how does the resource curve shape out. No, actually, actually the Savage Feast is kind of clunky here for us, so it's only going to be Clash of Agility. Or oh, Savage Feast. Ah, no, wait. Right, Savage Feast draws us into another card. I forgot. So it is a Claw again. Um, the other option is to Arsenal Blood Rush now, because the Claw doesn't kill them. And this way we secure that we are able to play our next hand. Because Blood Rush just enable our Claw and therefore gives us a, an access to go again. Yeah, and to have the best chances of killing them, we just ignore this attack. They don't have a an, an reckless swing or something similar. And yes, nice. The wild ride even got us into another blue card. Now there's no way for them to survive for coming with... Yes. 9 from the reckless swing, which demands 3 cards. Then 5 with the claw, which already kills them. And then we have a runner runner after that too. So that's that matchup for you. It's really, really grindy. And co can go both ways. In this case, Dory didn't have those really big pop-off turns. But we, we didn't get that lucky either. Though we misplayed a bit, but... Uh, we didn't get those big cast bones. We did not get a blood rush that was really good uh, until the end. So there is a lot of potential on both sides here. And yeah, if you want to see more KO gameplay, um, I have played a very interesting game yesterday against a Kano that was pitch stacking against us. 
So that's definitely some knowledge that's, that's valuable for the upcoming tournaments and I'd recommend you look into there and I'll see you then.